we have taken one more suture because there was a protrusion of the mucosa I saw. So one more interrupted suture was taken there. So we'll continue with the Lambert suture. Now the distance between the suture should be approximately 3 to 4 mm. So if we have reached up to the end, this is the final anastomosis here. So we'll go to the next slide piece. Yeah, the other type of anastomosis already I've talked about is the single layer, and this is the zero submucosal anastomosis. And it has got an advantage that it leads to an endomical layer approximation, good tissue holding, and there's a minimal tissue ne ne necrosis. So there's a remote possibility, or you can see it is more talk there in the literature that if you do double layer anastomosis, the inner layer may get necrosis. So that advantage can be taken by the doing a single layer. So I have borrowed this anastomosis there from my pediatric colleague and used to do a double layer anastomosis. The pediatric, pediatric guy, they do used to do a single layer anastomosis. So I want to show you exactly how they do it. So it is a zero, uh, zero submucosal uh, layer has been taken. The mucosa has been left out as such. And here's a few interrupted suture has been taken. This is the anterior layer that they are taking already. The posterior layer they have completed. So. I got this video today from my pediatrics colleague. They are doing a stoma closer here. So this is the way exactly I want to show you the technique exactly how it has been done. One leaves the mucosa there. And it is an interrupted suture from PDS has been PDS has been used here, yeah. Sorry. So when we talk about the single layer versus double layer, there's no difference in terms of anastomotic leak, perioperative complications, length of hospital stay or mortality, except the single layer anastomosis consume less time and the cost is somewhat less in comparison to that of the double layer anastomosis. I want to talk a few, uh, you can say, uh, topics more like how we can negotiate the caliber. Many times it's happened like the bowel disparity means the lumulate disparity is seen there in the bowel. How we can take care of that? We can have a cutback. We can do the cutback there in the into the bowel, which is has got a narrow lumen. And we can do a chitling already I have shown. One or the other option is one can do a side to side anastomosis or end to side anastomosis. The other way is like if there's not much in disparity, then one can take a narrow bite or the closer bite there from the narrow side and the wider bites there from the wider sides. The other option is that one can do a partial closer of the wider side. It may should be done in a in where there is a large dilated bubble is seen. The few more suturing uh, sutures which are uh, can be used that the suturing techniques that is the journey sutures and the gambi sutures. The journey suture is exactly similar as I have shown you there in the single layer anastomosis. So it is somewhat similar. And the gambi is basically if we talk about the classical gambi which has been described in the literature, one can see it is full thickness penetration from the serosa from to the mucosa and then again through the mucosa it's been brought out and again from this subserosa it is brought out there to the mucosa and again the full thickness. So this is a quite complex uh, suturing technique. Now there is a modified Gambis technique which is there. It is basically a full thickness. You can say suturing, they call it as a modified Gambis. So I conclude that if we have to do a bowel anastomosis, it should be attention free. There should not be attention there in, in anastomosis. Mostly it has been seen when we do a colorectal anastomosis, particularly for the rectal carcinomas. If we don't 
mobilize the bubble properly there should be an they, most of the time there is a means a tension present there at the anastomotic side that lead to a decrease of the anastomosis in post operative period so there sh it should be a tension free anastomosis appropriate suture should be used inverting edges and it may be done as a single layer or double layer depending upon the surgeons how one is doing it one should ensure the patency after doing an anastomosis there should not be any distal obstruction that should be ruled out beforehand with imaging during surgery and the closure of mesenteric defect is important thank you thank you dr punit excellent demonstration of the various techniques uh, for the post graduates as well as for the surgeons also because uh, anastomosis in ball anastomosis is one thing where surgeon's nightmare is leak and you have really very well covered what are the possibilities where leak occurs one is the tension anastomosis second is the vascularity of the end of where we are suturing and third is not to dabble with the mesentery also one important point you said that uh, closure of the mesentery because we have seen herniation of the mesentery uh, herniation through this hole in the mesentery sometimes in the ball later on in the post operative period thank you well done we'll come back for the question and sessions later on now i invite dr vimal vimal is dr vimal lime is a senior consultant vascular endovascular surgeon in lords hospital kochi kerala he has got 16 years of experience he has done his basic training from the uh, the velor and uh, i request dr vimal to give his presentation thank you uh, dr moinithin for the warm introduction good evening one and all and respected uh, office bearers of the asi senior teachers in the profession and young colleagues and friends uh, there wouldn't be any surgeon in his whole career who hasn't had haven't had to face a situation of a rescuer or correct his own vascular catastrophe so knowing a vascular basic principles of vascular anastomosis and getting used to repairing an injured vessel is always a help to anybody who comes across this injury so greetings from kochi and uh, in this session i would like to stick on to basic principles and vascular anastomosis as you all know it's the margin of error is very low uh, we are all uh, faced in three situations in vascular anastomosis generally one is an end to end anastomosis wherein you either need to bring up two close vessels uh, and anastomose them second scenario is a scenario where you need to uh, do an arteriotomy or make an injury into a closure wherein you do a patch repair that's a little difficult to learn a procedure third is more frequently done in the vascular setting that's a end to side anastomosis where it is performed in a revascularization procedures like femoropopliteal bypass and uh, uh, av access procedure where you do end to side anastomosis i would be probably sticking on to uh, the end to end anastomosis and then to side anastomosis to familiarize you about the basic instruments that you need from going from here to clockwise the the bakey forceps which have got atraumatic force ends the castro vijo needle holder which is used for uh, handling sutures which are less than 600 proline in size and it has got the advantage of rotating for use of forehand and backhand uses the port scissors of various angles the elastic loops which can come into play where you don't have clamps to uh, loop a vessel you can use a double loop and control the vessel a fine uh, metsembone scissors with blunt ends an irrigation cannula with blunt end to avoid uh, trauma to the intima while flushing cannulas and the bulldog clamps and the coolie or the debakey clamps and finally a uh, straight uh, mosquito with rubber catheter uh, grooved onto the limbs to catch hold of your switches these are the minimum Dr. basic Vimal, your slides are not moving your slides are not moving it's moving sir alright it's not moving on the live streaming so the slide go to the slide show mode this is not slide show mode i have just integrated into a video sir so it will come by its own in the time sir so uh, we are we I are on the first slide only you are seeing the screen yourself vimal yeah yeah i'm i'm on, we the, are screen, on the first sir. slide Yes. We are on the first slide. Yes. Can you see we the proline only... slide here? No, no, we are only on no, the no. first slide. We are on the first slide, Lord's Hospital.
my god how is it now sir no same 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 let me share it once more sir Yeah, yeah, we, we are coming. We're seeing that. Just try to move it a little bit. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's on a video mode, sir. It's moving. Let me just make it fast. Can you see the instruments in this, sir? No, no. We are only seeing the patch, the two ends. That's all. Oh, there's some problem with the sharing of the. Yeah, now, now we, we can. are seeing the instruments. Instruments. I think when I go to the full screen, there's some problem. No, we can see it now. This is the we can see the instruments now. Can I go in this we can see the instruments now. Yeah, you can it continue on this movie. mode. So the these are the basic the, vascular instruments which are required for uh, the completion of a vascular anastomosis. The Debakey forceps, the castro the needle holder, the port scissors, the silastic loops, which come handy when you don't have atraumatic vascular clamps, and metzimbom scissors. The irrigation cannula of the heparin uh, for the irrigation saline to in irrigate the indima, the bulldog clamps and the coolie or the debakey clamps for atraumatic uh, vascular control, and the red sh rubber shot catheter which is shoved onto a onto a straight mosquito for controlling the or putting a stay on the sutures. So these are basically uh, the the basic requirements for uh, a vascular anastomosis. So these are suture materials which we generally use in vascular anastomosis. This range from 2O proline to 8O, 9O proline, polypropylene sutures. You can use polyamide sutures or else Gore-Tex or PTFE sutures are also used. So the size of the suture selection depend upon the vessel size. 2O, 3O for an iota, 4O for an iliax, 5O, 6O for a popliteal and a SFA, and 6O to below knee and uh, tibial artery as a 702 radial and dorsalis pedis arteries. You always use a double lump needle whereby you have two needles attached to the uh, either end of the suture and usually atraumatic needles are used. In calcified vessels, you can sometimes use uh, taper point or reverse cutting sutures. Gore-Tex sutures are very expensive. They are used in biliary anastomosis or transplant anastomosis. They have one is to one suture needle diameter ratio wherein the suture holes are left uh, less uh, the less of bleeding on the suture holes so techniques of vascular anastomosis basically are can be interrupted can be continuous it can be open or closed also basic principles of vascular anastomosis you should expose and skeletalize the vessels enough with preservation of as much as branches as possible but you should have both ends freely uh, visible and accessible to anastomosis. Proximal and distal control of the arteries should be done after systemic heparinization for three minutes unless the patient is in severe bleed or coagulopathy to prevent stagnation thrombosis. You always aim at a watertight anastomosis with endothelium to endothelium approximation. Everting full suture are usually done full thickness because unlike bowel anastomosis, vascular anastomosis is always a uh, Singular anastomosis, and in, you should never allow adventitia to come in to the uh, inside of the su suturing uh, line because they can incite thrombosis. It should be small, evenly dispersed bites. How far from the edge and how space they are depends on the vessel same, size and the diameter and the thickness of the vessel. It could be a few millimeters from two to four millimeter uh, spacing. So it should be zero tension at the anastomosis or the knots. And generally, a posterior to anterior and angle to center approach is do, done when you do a continuous suturing. And always you have to take into consideration that always you take inside out bites on the artery because if you take outside in bites on the artery, the plaque can get dislodged. So when you do a continuous suturing, you should also take into account that. Sorry. Also take into account that the the heel of the anastomosis is the area which is on the narrow ankle and the toe of the anastomosis which you close 
last is away, away from the anastomosis. So control of the arteriotomy bleed or control of the vasculature can be with clamp, silastic loop, bulldog, or a Foley's catheter and a silk thread. This is the basic suture technique that you use in a end-to-side anastomosis. And this is a principle. Once you learn this principle, you can suture any vessels. So you have the heel of the anastomosis and the toe of the anastomosis. You have two ends of the suture lines. You start from the side or the end, away from the line of the vessel, away from the surgeon. And you take in out on the artery, out in on the vein or the graft, and you come around the corner and come this side. So you complete either side of the anastomosis and reach the toe and you always make sure that you never put a knot on the corners because uh, unlike in a bowel, if you put corners on the knots on the corner of the anastomosis, you are very likely to uh, narrow the anastomosis. If ever you have to have a resuturing because the tie, the suture breaks, uh, resuturing can further narrow the anastomosis. So this is the completion of that looping and this is the completion of the suture line as per picture. So I am going to show you a technique of, of uh, end to side anastomosis in this uh, video session. So ephemeropobletal bypass is being done in this uh, in this uh, vessel actually is a reverse saphenous vein graft which is used in this uh, patient and the common femoral artery is exposed and prepared. So that you can see that the the uh, this is the lateral side of the patient, medial side of the patient, cranial and the caudal aspect. This is the control of the exposed common femoral artery with coolie clamp, the profunda femoris artery with this uh, looped and clamped and the superficial femoral artery which is clamped. So as you proceed, you clear, you have given system heparin, 5000 units, you expose the vessel, clear the adventitia first to avoid any adventitia coming into the suture line. You have got thick plaque on the anterior wall, but you cannot avoid it. You incise with an arteriotomy by pulling the artery uh, upwards, okay, taking care not to nick the posterior wall of the artery. The arteriotomy is extended with the port scissors. You can see that there is thick plaque on the anterior wall and there is clot. It is copious amount of heparin saline, that is 500 ml of saline with 1000 units of heparin is used to irrigate the, the wall and take out all plaques. The suture we use in this groin is a 6 -er proline and uh, double arm proline suture. You can see both ends and if you see that it's a traumatic round body needle with 60 centimeter length and 3 8 of circle arm. Now you keep one end of the suture uh, as a stay with a rubber shot. The reverse saphenous vein graft is fashioned for the proximal anastomosis and you start the suturing on the contralateral or the further side and the bite on the artery is always a uh, in out artery so you make a u stitch basically on the proximal corner that's a heel of the anastomosis and one end of the uh, suture is basically held as a stay with the rubber shot your assistant does two things you he keeps the uh, the graft vessel stable for an in out anastomosis on that or an in out out in bite on the vein and also follows the suture with a wet hands or a wet gloves and you can see that how I take the suture bite. They should be perpendicular to the arterial wall. They should be evenly spaced and minimum handling of the needle with my fingers. So I take in out on the artery, out in on the vein and three or four sutures are tapped on that side. And you have to take special precaution while taking bites on the corners that you should never take a posterior wall bite. So minimum Holding of the indima should be exercised. If, if ever you are holding, it should be a soft bite. And when you take corners, you can use an artery forceps to take it inside and then see the posterior wall and take the suture bite. So once you complete that three so rows of on either side, then you do what is known as a parachuting where you pull the suture and the vessel alternately and shoot it down to the vessel. So that's a heel of the anastomosis which is complete. The shot is kept on the other side and you complete the nearer line of suturing with a uh, continuous suture technique. It's a single layer anastomotic technique. You can see that assistant is helping me. I'm holding the vein and the arterial adventitia alternately. Perpendicular bite. Very often you can see that you keep the needle at a little angle on the end of the needle holder, a little forward angle so that you can advance fairly rapidly in anastomosis. So, 
the speed of the anastomosis as you go and learn vascular principles is also important because to minimize the clamp time. So once you complete the nearer row of sutures, closer to three-fourth of that line, you stop that line and then exchange the rubber shot to this side. And you know that you need to come on the opposite wall. So always make sure that you're not crushing the indima of the artery and a denuded indima can lead to devastating consequences of a thrombosis at the later phase. So I am using a reverse hand technique here on the other side with the other end of the needle, which is again out in on the vein and in on of the artery. So make sure that you are not taking the posterior wall. It's lifted up by the retraction of the assistant and you complete it to the uh, top end of the toe of the anastomosis. Once you reach the toe of the anastomosis, it's imperative that you take separate bites on the vein and the artery. It's not a through and through bite on the vein and the artery because you need. it's difficult to see the intima of the artery while you take the bite. So you can take the three corner stitch, that's three on either side of the corner and one stitch at the corner, but make sure that you come to one side of the corner and take a knot. So this is how the corner stitch is taken. And it's also, uh, to be uh, to be noted that before you complete the suturing on uh, and not, you have to understand that there might be some elements of clots inside and you need to de-air the uh, suture line. So that's a irrigation needle going in and flushing it so that the posterior wall hitching can be well seen. Any debris is left behind is, is washed off. Next, what you do is complete the suturing. And before you tie, that's the last two sutures taken out. So... I'm not, I'm trying not to hold the needle at all during the entire process. So you place the first suture before you tie the second suture. What you do is always take off the distal clamp so that if you take off the proximal clamp, it might have a little bit of too much of bleeding. So you allow the blood to fill and all the air to come out of the anastomotic line and all both distal clamps are taken off. So never try to knot a suture line while uh, a proximal clamp is released because the sutures might go loose. So that's the completion of the distal proximal anastomosis. And you have, you can see that any minor bleeds can be controlled by gauze packing for four to five minutes and a good anti great flow is got there. Now, next is a case of a direct end-to-end -end anastomotic suturing. You can see that a crushed brachial, distal brachial artery is there. We have clamped and controlled it with two instruments, vascular instruments and trimmed the vascular edges. A 7 double arm proline is used again on a systemized, I mean, systematic heparinized patient. You always wait three minutes after giving heparin for it to act prior to clamping the vessels unless the patient has got severe bleed, coagulopathy or other injuries. So you take, so when you have two arteries on either ends, you get confused where to go in out. So general principle is if the artery which is on the receiving side of the blood, that's a distal side, the flow of the blood is against the wall. So always in out on the artery on the distal side and out in on the artery on the proximal side. That's the basic principles when of vascular suturing when you do anastomosis of two arteries. If it is a vein and artery, always in out of the artery. So you can see that the posterior wall is always completed first in a direct anastomosis because you cannot do a anterior wall, then rotate the uh, vessel like in a bowel and then do a posterior wall later. So if you have to see the intima and the corners well, you complete the posterior wall first and then do the parachuting. You need copious irrigation with saline to prevent the, even though the coefficient of friction of polypropylene is very less, you need to prevent the suture getting entangled and breaking. So that's the parachuting done. And then you complete the corners. The proximal corner is completed first. Again, in out on the uh, distal vessel and out in on the artery. And these bites, if you can see, notice that all, always, almost always, the bites are perpendicular to the vessel wall. And they once they are tightened, you can see that the wall is slightly inverted. Never should a arterial end go inverted after an anastomosis. So the flush is done. Make sure that blood is flowing. Uh, I am if not uh, declam the distal because all the air will go to the distal. So once you once you're sure that the anastomosis is watertight and there is no leaks in a major vessel anastomosis, you can irrigate it, complete the anastomosis, and then uh, do a knotting 
with hand tie so while you do hand ties always you do hand tie with polypropylene or uh, smaller switches uh, unless in interrupted switches where you need to save switcher lines switches for more length so enough of uh, hands wash should be done or irrigation with heparin saline should be done on the fingers to prevent uh, the suture entangling uh, while you are knotting or other the sutures which are seven or eight are likely to break you always do under this under magnification here you are not seeing magnification in the camera but i am using a magnified loops of 3x or 4x for better visualization better uh, better uh, techniques to prevent thrombosis and better position so that's a completed end to end anastomosis so this is a, a picture showing that the patient uh, the in out sutures or the out in sutures in the artery can actually dislodge a in uh, plaque in the uh, intima and then produce dissection and when you if you are very particular that you should take out in you should use a forceps to guide the or support the plaque while taking the anastomosis so these are common mistakes that might occur with a, a novice uh, this is a purse string which is produced while you do a end to end in a smaller vessel less than 3 mm always use interrupted technique rather than continuous loose switches can be managed by looping them with another bit of proline or polypropylene and taking another bite and suturing it off so a vessel hole or a suture cutting off cut through also can be managed by a small felt or a vein patch being done and reinforced at that suture line so what are the do's and don'ts in a vascular anastomosis though vascular anastomosis is easy to learn and understand precision has to be performed has to be ensured to prevent because the margin of error is very less heparinization should be done whenever possible patient should be initiated at least 3 days prior on low dose ecosprin for preventing platelet formation in the vessel intima which is diseased always look for back bleed that's a distal clamp should be released prior to your completion of knotting minimize narrowing nar narrowing at the anastomotic area patch arteriotomies when and where they are required because primary suturing of a vessel at a haste might narrow your anastomosis and produce thrombosis minimize clamp time as much as possible because if you want to perfect the anastomosis you might take more time but ischemia end organ damage the warm ischemia end organ damage and reperfusion injury becomes proportionately more with uh, uh, more more the as the clamp time increases always remember that you need to have in out switches in the arteries Everting switches with endothelial approximation is the rule, and interrupted switches if the vessel is less than 0.3 uh, centimeters. So that completes my anastomosis. Sorry for exceeding the time, and there was a technical glitch. So vascular anastomosis is basically simple. It's easy to learn, but it should be supervised and done with precision to prevent thrombosis. Generally, these patients are not heparinized post-op, especially in larger vessels. They should be on a single anterior platelet. Uh, and continued for a minimum of three period, three months till new intima is formed. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor Vimal. Excellent narration. And uh, what what are the things to be done? What are the things to be avoided? You have given beautiful video demonstrations, and they will be very helpful for general surgeons who will be operating. Most of the time, general surgeons encounter a vascular injury during emergency situations, and where if you know the technique. Uh, we can handle it better there on the table itself rather than looking for vascular surgeons because vascular surgeons are far and few general surgeons are <laughs> available everywhere. Thank you very much once again. Uh, the third speaker is Dr. Pavanendra Lal. Uh, he'll be talking on ureteric anastomosis. He's a director and professor and head of Department of Surgery, Chairman Division of Minimal Access Surgery, Maulana Azad Medical College, University of Delhi, and it's associated, he is also associated with Lok Naik Hospital, New Delhi. He is a recipient of many awards. Prominent amongst them are Sardar Vallabhai Patel Award in 2021, MMC, MAMC Distinguished Alumnus Award in 2019, Dr. B.C. Rai National Award 2016, Delhi State Health Award 2015, Commonwealth Fellowship Award, UGC 2007, Overseas College Medal 2010, International Guest Scholar 2012, Traveling Fellowship Award 1998. The list is very much uh, long. Uh, I'll, I hope Pavendra Lal will excuse me if I cut short because we are running short of time. I request Dr. Pavendra Lal to start his lecture.
thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Moinuddin, for that very kind introduction. And uh, thank you to the leadership, uh, the president and the entire senior uh, leadership uh, for this invitation. Um, I'm speaking today on the principles of ureteric anastomosis as uh, required for a general surgeon. Uh, so normally, uh, we would uh, like to keep out of harm's way of the ureter, but there are indications, there are opportunities, and there are incidents where one uh, encounters ureter and one needs to manage it in that particular situation uh, to the best of our uh, ability. So uh, the general principle of a ureteric anastomosis uh, is that uh, the, the ureters are, uh, you know, they're small tubes. Uh, the ureter is about 25 centimeter in length and about uh, 4 to 5 mm in width. So, um, and it's a muscular tube. So, when there is an injury, uh, there could be a loss of length or there could be uh, just a division or there could be jagged edges. So, it is important that the edges are uh, sharpened out, smooth uh, and, uh, you know, cut out. And then because it's a small tube, if it is uh, approximated just like an end-to-end -end, uh, circle, then it is likely to have a stricture or a narrowing. So it is uh, preferred to have it spatulated. And the way to spatulate is to do it at uh, 180 degree angle opposite to each other, which is shown here in the uh, image. And I can show it with my arrow that if it is done at nine o'clock, then the other spatulation of the other side ureter would have to be at three o'clock. So they are opposite each other. Uh, the, uh, the approximation of the ureter can be done uh, either continuous or in an interrupted manner. It is safer to be uh, interrupted uh, in a smaller, narrower ureter, uh, as was uh, uh, in, uh, you know, um, clarified by Dr. Wimmel as well. And uh, if, if it is a longer length than a continuous suture, such as in a pyloplasty, where we do, a, where we are doing an Anderson Heinz pyloplasty for a PUJ obstruction, then a continuous suturing can also be done. What are the sutures of choice? Uh, absorbable material is the suture of choice. It could be a polydioxanone uh, or a polygalactin, and one could use anywhere between 3O to 5O on a round body needle to approximate. Uh, it could be a full thickness. Normally, most of the surgeons are using a full thickness but it is also possible to approximate it without including the mucosa. If the muscle is good and the ureter is go uh, nice and yielding, then as shown in the figure here, it could be, uh, you could avoid uh, mucosa so that there is a, a lesser exposure of urine on any suture material and foreign body is not there. So encrustations or chances of forming any uh, stone or um, or um, concretion is less. However, because we are using absorbable, uh, those uh, chances remain very low anyway. What are the normal indications where we encounter? It could be a traumatic situation where there is a trauma to the ureter. It could be more importantly and more commonly where we are called in as surgeons to uh, uh, encounter is during surgery when there is a transaction during uh, uh, surgeries of the pelvis where the ureter is very closely approximated such as happens in the uh, colorectal malignancies usually of the ref left side uh, when when uh, anterior resection or an abdominal perineal resection is being done uh, commonly we also get referrals from gynecological cases where there is a uh, there is a inadvertent injury or a ligation of the ureter um, during that surgery um, endometriosis is one condition where there could be injury because of severe, uh, you know, inflammation and fibrosis that happens and uh, any kind of emergency surgery could also be an opportunity. In elective situation, one could be encountering strictures, one could be doing pyloplasties. If you are doing total cystectomy for CA bladder, then you need to uh, re-implant the um, ureter into the bladder. Uh, so those are uh, situations where one may encounter this uh, ureter. Uh, so this, uh, in the next few slides, I'm just trying to show how the spatulation simply works and how it is possible to 
uh, approximate it. So we start with the two angles first. And once those two angles have got stay sutures at the edges of the spatulation, then one has uh, already divided the, uh, the, the width of the ureter into two parts. And then you do one half on one side and then uh, turn around the uh, stay sutures at the edges of the at the apex of the spatulations and then do the other half uh, once again on the other side. So uh, that is the um, pictorial de uh, depiction uh, on number one on the extreme left shows how the ureter could be found uh, divided. Uh, you need to remove the devitalized tissue and sharpen it out into a complete circular tube and then you perform the spatulation at 180 degree opposite to each other to create a wide, long anastomosis. And the way to start it, at shown at number three, is to take sutures at the corner of the spatulated ureter, that is the apex, as I would say it. And then uh, once these sutures have been taken, um, then you have two halves and you can uh, approximate it either by continuous or by interrupted suture uh, running from one side to the other and keep uh, uh, a closed suction drain uh, like a a JP drain uh, or any other tube uh, alongside it. So that's the general principle. So this is uh, uh, the first instance of, I had to do a collection when I was asked by uh, uh, the leadership and Dr. Abraham to uh, prepare. We had to go into our uh, thing because you never record some of, the, some of the things that we keep doing. So this is the situation of a divided ureter and this I was called uh, by a speciality department when they were doing their um, um, uh, colorectal surgery. You can see there is a divided ureter. In fact, there is not even a single division. There is another division below and uh, you have a segment loss. So you need to mobilize. Uh, you have to see whether you are able to use this if there is enough vascularity. And so we were able to, uh, you know, do the same technique. So that was the uh, ends that were being mobilized. You can see here on the right side, the uh, ends brought in together with spatulation and then the uh, DJ stent was put in uh, and the anastomosis, that is the final uh, part of the picture where we are uh, doing the uh, repair. So this was not a video, this was just in pictures that was recorded at that particular point of time. So this is uh, a case of uh, a stricture which we got and here again uh, this is a reimplantation being done um, into the um, bladder because of segment length. So the same technique of uh, spatulation and uh, use of uh, uh, sutures. So that's an approximation that is happening. You can see full thickness sutures between the ureter and the bladder. So that's like a, a, a reimplantation of the ureter into the uh, bladder. So, uh, th and then once the posterior wall is done, you put in the DJ stent on both sides. And complete the anterior wall beyond that and in this case uh, we are using uh, absorbable uh, polygalactin uh, suture in a continuous fashion and the important trick is to have uh, avoid uh, handling the edges so um, that is the completed part of this particular case and uh, then uh, we come to uh, two cases of uh, uh, pyloplasty, which we nowadays, uh, for the last many years now, have been doing uh, laparoscopic. So that's first of the uh, two surgeries. This is for the left side um, um, case of a 60-year-old lady who had come with the, um, hydronephrosis and a stone. And uh, this is the mobilization of the colon. So on the left side, one will need to take the uh, intestine away um, and uh, uh, reach the ureter. Ureter is the important landmark. So, um, and uh, 
um, this this particular case also had a stone. So uh, that was quite rare. It's not usual to have. You are uh, now we are dissecting the uh, the ureter and the PUJ. So this is at a slightly um, larger uh, speed, and uh, one needs to appreciate that never is any illuminal structure uh, grasped. It is always kind of retracted with open instruments. So that's the pelvis being dissected. And uh, I will now just skip to the suturing part. That's the PUJ and the removal of the um, That was the stone. The stone has gone in. That was a large stone. And then uh, the PUJ has been excised. And then the upper part of the pelvis is uh, closed. And that is now the, uh, the spatulated end of the ureter. You can see the spatulation that has been done. So I think I have the opportunity to show you um, uh, in this the division of the yeah so that was that's the spatulation that's the first suture at the edge very important and then once that is taken so very important uh, risk that can happen here is about rotation so there is it's always important you can see we have taken uh, another suture here which is uh, serving as the landmark at uh, 12 o'clock so that there is no um, twist or torsion of the ureter. And now the uh, the pelvis suture is being uh, the anastomosed to the uh, one wall of the ureter. So that's the posterior anastomosis that is happening. And we only uh, at the most hold the adventitia but never the mucosa and avoid as far as possible. And that takes uh, takes us through to complete the posterior wall. The DJ stent has been introduced. And then the flap goes to the other side. And uh, the anterior wall now gets closed. And you can appreciate a part of the uh, stand being visible and that's the upper part of the pelvis which is yet to be closed because that's a reduction pyloplasty anderson hines dismembered pyloplasty so once that is done then we go up from there and close the um, remaining part of the pelvis so the puj has been completed and the upper part of the pelvis is now being closed So that's the completed picture of the whole surgery. And then the next one and the last one today is a right-sided uh, pyloplasty for a 35-year-old lady who had a right-sided PUJ. So once again, the ports are being taken into position. We use a retractor to take the liver up uh, and you can see the bulge. Again, the colon uh, uh, has to be mobilized medially and uh, the pelvis to be dissected. Um, and once that happens, we have to dissect the PU junction. Um, we found here there was a crossing vessel, which was the cause of the hydronephrosis, which is uh, commonly seen as one of the findings. We have to preserve that vessel. And once you divide the pelvis in the dismembered pyloplasty, uh, we uh, transpose the anastomosis in front of the vessel. So you can see the transverse vessel here, which has been preserved. That's the vessel crossing in front. And now that's the uh, excision of the PUJ. And if it is vascular, then sometimes we have to use a monopolar hook. So... Combination of that and sharp scissors. 
depending on the type of uh, inflammation present. And then that's the PUJ. So here, the um, that's the start of the, that's the uh, stay suture to orient the uh, ureter uh, correctly and avoid its uh, talking. The excess of the PUJ is excised. And now, importantly, the spatulation of the ureter, I hope I'm able to show you that uh, in this video. So that's the removal of the uh, PUJ and we are closing the upper part of the uh, pelvis coming serially down and then leaving a little bit for the anastomosis to happen. Uh, final uh, sizing of the pelvis is going to be done later on and then uh, we get the stay suture and the spatulation is already done. You saw that the, the spatulation I think just happened. Yeah. So that's the apex suture, which is taken from the uh, distal most edge. How much spatulation about one to 1 1.5 centimeters is what is required so that you have a nice uh, a long oblique anastomosis and then this in this particular suture i am using a pds so you can see now the first suture is the most important one so that is the posterior wall uh, of the ureter being approximated with the uh, pelvis and you can see that's a nice uh, wide uh, ureter that we have here uh, and uh, I think it's uh, it's back to polygalactin only. I think I can see the braid here. So our preferred suture still remains polygalactin because of the ease of handling uh, at this uh, in this particular anastomosis. It is uh, much more pliable. But we have used poro. Uh, PDS uh, um, when the quality of suture we are getting is good then we prefer to take that so that's the completion of the posterior uh, layer and then the uh, DJ stent is going to go in shortly because the posterior wall is done so that's the DJ stent which comes in and you always need to put that so it goes in easily. So uh, just with a guide wire uh, is not a problem. And we use a pusher. So that's a red, which is a pusher. Then remove the yes, sir. Um, guide wire and it stays in position. And then the anterior layer. Now this part of the, uh, the double J stent is going to go into the pelvis. And this is all laparoscopic. And the average operation time is 90 minutes to 120 minutes, depending on uh, any case, uh, the degree of difficulty, adhesions. But don't the time is not important. It's important to make sure that we do a good quality anastomosis. And all these kidneys are monitored with regular uh, periodic DTPA scans to see that the function at which we operated uh, has actually improved and the kidney has been saved. So that's the last bit of the uh, completed right-sided PUJ and we put a drain. So that was just the last one. So to summarize, uh, ureteric anastomosis would need precision. One needs to be aware that uh, orientation of the ureter is important. One needs to be careful about luminal narrowing that takes place at the site where we make the incision. So the apex stitch has to be very important and uh, one has to be careful that one does not take the posterior part of the mucosa so that there is no accidental narrowing. Always use a DJ stent, patheterize the patient, 
uh, because the DJ stent otherwise uh, would, uh, you know, start draining from a full bladder. So uh, we catheterize for just 24 to 48 hours to ensure that the patient is voiding completely on their own. And then there is a need for a drain. The drain can be removed in another 24 hours and the patient can be home. The DJ stent can be removed with a urine culture being sterile at four to six weeks after this surgery. So uh, those were the tips. Thank you very much once again uh, for this opportunity. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Pawan Indralal. Excellent demo uh, demonstration of uh, difficult situations where ureters were in the pelvis and also PUJ junction. Very good uh, demonstration by pictographs and videos and laparoscopic uh, uh, anastomosis. The technique of spatula, excellent uh, because all most of the general surgeons tend to do tend to do end-to-end -end anastomosis, but the spatula is learning for us also. Thank you very much. We'll come to the question as a session. Uh, first is uh, Mr. Pavanit. Uh, Puneet, are you there, sir? Yeah, Dr. Puneet. I'm here. Yeah, yeah. There are a few questions which have come uh, from uh, the uh, audience. Uh, one is whether we can use uh, use of boil clamps. Current status is it better to avoid? I can't get you, sir. Uh, is it uh, in the Current scenario or present scenario. scenario, can we avoid the use of uh, bowel clamps during anastomosis in order to... Uh, uh, as such, when we are operating there in the routine cases, we can avoid the bowel clamps as such, the yeah. non-crushing clamp, what we are using. Yeah. It. But when you are operating there in the emergency uh, setting, it is important to apply the bowel clamps. Means It is important because it will prevent the spillage as such. And Sorry. most of the time when we are operating there in emergency, the bowel are loaded and they need a the decompression also. So it is important when we operate in emergency. However, in routine cases, it may not be important. Yeah, yeah. Because but now there is important a... that one should, yes. one should uh, avoid putting these clamps over the mesentery. That is the most important thing one should do it. Second question is whether what is the best suture material in two layer anastomosis? You have shown vicryl and then uh, silk. I see when when we talk about the sutures which is to be used. See, we all know that what is the ideal suture material nowadays? It is the PDS which is considered the ideal suture material. So for all uh, anastomosis, the PDS is preferred nowadays uh, rather than being there for the absorbable suture material. So it, PDS is a place for all suture material. If it is available, the patient is, you can say, affordable. We should always go for a PDS. In pediatric anastomosis, single layer where we use, can PDS be used? Yeah, PDS is the uh, means is a suture which may be used. Yeah, in, in the in anastomosis, what I have shown you here, the PDS is being used here. Where do we start the anastomosis from the mesentic border or anti mesentic? Uh, basically, ideally, we should have started there from the mesenteric side. It is important because that is the sorrow area, what we call it as. And that is the area where which is very prone to leak. And therefore, it has been said that one should have started there from the mesenteric side. Yeah, yeah. Most of the leaks occur that way. That is the area which yeah, is that is the sorrow angle. What obscure. we call it yes, we the get sorrow neglected angle. and that yes, yes, sorrow area. Thank you, thank you, Puni okay. And Doctor Vimal is there? We have some questions for him. Yes, sir. Please. Yeah. Can we do vascular anastomosis with single needle instead of two arms? Yeah, we can do, sir. Very much. But probably uh, the, the only issue is uh, we need to have a longer suture length. The needle length would be uh, very long. The I mean, suture length should be more than 90 centimeters. Usually we use double arm needle. And very likely there is a chance that the first needle you use can bend and get damaged while you use. So it's always preferable to use a double arm needle. And it's easier to go around with either ends, exchange sides when you come to, from the posterior side to anterior side. Because it's easy if you can see the corners better with double arm needles, you can exchange sites. Yes, sir. Any precautions to avoid aneurysm at the site, uh, suture site later on? See, aneurysms basically happen. Uh, it can be true aneurysm and pseudoaneurysms. Pseudoaneurysms occur when there is a leak. It can be a suture hole leak or there can be a spacing between the uh, sutures which give away later because the BP rises. So. You have to ensure that the patient's BPS come back to the normal level before you 
close of the wound and it's a watertight anastomosis and there is no leak. Second is it should not be in an infected field because when you use synthetic grafts in an infective field, very often you can get pseudoneurysms. True aneurysms, you cannot do much about it because these are degenerative changes and they occur due to probably atherosclerotic and uh, hypertensive changes. So normal tension, maintain BP is the main thing in uh, preventing true aneurysms. What are the indications to do in interrupted suturing? Interrupted probably in interrupted I write like that. We use <laughs> a continuous suture which is easier to perform and it's faster because you need not you do need to do only one knot. But interrupted sutures you do when the vessel lumen diameter is less than three mm, especially in digital arteries and reimplantation, microvascular surgeries. And the advantage only advantage is that you can have a little more spacing between the switches. Probably if you do a radial artery with the interrupted suture, probably you need to, you can finish in four or five bytes and, but you need to do more nottings. While placing a vascular patching, what is the material, suitable material, ideal material we should use? The best material, it all depends on the amount of pressure that is there in the vessel, sir. If you are doing an aortic patch, you need to have the best synthetic substitute is an artery, but you don't get an artery replacement at the NIATA. So you use a PTFE. PTFE is the best material. You can use a Dacron also, which is polypropylene terephthalate. But by and large, best materials in a carotid and a peripheral vascular patching is a vein patch because it is very resistant to infection. So if you can get a thick vein wall, which is uh, pliable and not a sequelae, I mean, it has not never had a sequelae to phlebitis, it's a pliable vein wall is the best because it's resistant to infection. That's the most important thing in a vascular patch, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vimal. Can we have yes. Professor Pavan Indralal? Yes, please. Yes, sir. Is there any situation to avoid a stent in ureter after anastomosis, sir? Uh, well, no, I would say that as far as possible, the anastomosis, uh, ureteric anastomosis should be stented. Uh, basically, it uh, helps to decompress uh, the urine, uh, the ure, the ureter, and it's the it's a small lumen, so you know it's always at a risk of uh, stricturing. So one may get away without it if you don't have it. If you've done it well, you don't have a DJ stent. You have no option. But uh, in ideal situations, one should be doing uh, putting a stent uh, over a over an anastomosis. Uh, because there are situations when we are working in a medical college, we get call, uh, call as you rightly said, from clinic department that ureter has been transected. And then we as general surgeons go and do an anastomosis and we don't have the help of urologist who can put a stent through cystoscopy. So those are the situations where so, can we avoid it? So if I think it is a good practice to have a DJ stent handy in all uh, you know theaters, uh, okay. one should have DJ stent. And uh, no, you don't need to do a uh, urethroscopy or a urethroscopy to introduce, as I showed you, all the stents that uh, I showed Demo. in all the cases were all put, put in uh, from the abdominal wound in open surgery or in laparoscopic surgery. So it's possible to thread in uh, the lower side and then uh, push the uh, rest of it on the proximal side, uh, whether you are at the PU junction or whether are you are in a you're in the mid ureter or the lower ureter, it is possible to insert the ureter, uh, the ureteric stent uh, without having to do cystoscopy. Sir, any tips to avoid ischemia of ureter? Because this is one worrying factor when we have mobilized the ureter for a long time for, for the anastomosis. We want a anastomosis without tension. So we are at the back of mind. Uh, is there any ischemia we have caused to the ureter? Absolutely. So I think that's a very important point. And I would say that ureter is pretty robust because of its uh, periureteric uh, plexus of artery and vein. But still, there is a limit to what one can uh, mobilize. I would say five to seven centimeters is the maximum one can go on either side. Beyond that, one would uh, you know make the ureter devitalized uh, by breaking off the smaller vascular channels that uh, form the ureteric periureteric plexus. So uh, with that 
and number two there should not be much tension so if there is a lot of tension because of a mixing segment then one needs to uh, think of a soas hitch operation where you bring up the bladder uh, proximally to and uh, stitch it to the uh, the soas uh, proximal to the uh, sacral joint and uh, uh, get a little bit of a length um, for reimplantation into the bladder or you may have to uh, think of a bowery flap to uh, be created but that all uh, needs experience and uh, training so since we get a lot of these complicated injuries uh, we keep doing it often but uh, uh, for the uh, one who is doing it uh, rarely uh, this uh, is best sent to a, a a center which does it more often thank you thank you very much thank you all of the speakers you have done an excellent job i see our knowledge has been revitalized and i hope like me many surgeons have benefited apart from post grad students uh, i thank dr prabal nogi president of the asi pravin uh, suryanshi vice president sanjay jain immediate past president dr siddhar ji director academic council Dr. Pratap Orate, Honorary Secretary, Dr. Bhavanarala Yadav, Honorary Treasurer, and Dr. John Abraham, who is the soul behind this program. Today, conducted the, he's an academician and they conducted this program online. I'm very much grateful. Thank you once again for being here and being associated with ASI. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Santosh. Yeah. Uh, I just would like to congratulate all of the uh, contributors today for such wonderful, practically oriented, basic topics, very well covered. And uh, I'm sure those uh, videos and the tips what you have given are of immense help to the juniors in picking up. And uh, I'm really amazed at uh, the uh, videos of vascular anastomosis shown by Dr. Leib and also Pavanindra Lal being a general surgeon doing such a vast majority of general surgery gambit, but he has shown so nicely the anastomosis of urotric anastomosis so very well, uh, which can make even a good urologist shy, uh, feel shy about it. Very nice. And at the same time, Puneet, you have been very exemplary in touching upon the basics and with the nomenclature you have given for the type of suturing, which is very essential for postgraduate students to face their exams. They may be uh, asked these names, so they need to be uh, versed with these names and what they are. Uh, my only uh, tips to add is maintain the vascularity, avoid tension, and use the proper technique and the suture material. And uh, of course, my only question would be for Puneet, what about the uh, advantages if you find for mucosa sparing anastomosis? Do you really practice any time? Or uh, as per the literature, it has been recommended, Puneet? Uh, basically, nowadays, most of the surgeons, they have switched from a double layer to the single layer anastomosis. However, those who are practicing single layer, it is okay. Otherwise, the double layer is also works very well. So already studies have shown that if you do it uh, single layer, it is good. But if you are not trained to, then you can continue with the double layer, which has been done in the past for years and years. And of course, the what you are talking about, the mucosal sparing is mostly the single layer anastomosis, which has been done. Thank you. Okay. So I leave it there. Uh, wonderful session. Uh, ASA time is really becoming popular and it is being useful as we see. And uh, we hope in the days to come, it becomes more popular as well. Uh, let us spread this news of the wonderful uh, work being done by the Association Sages Surgeons of India uh, with this leader, Dr. Prabhul Nyogi, the president. And uh, I have here Dr. Sanjay Jain, the immediate past president and the uh, vice president, Dr. Praveen Suryamshi. Prabhul, for any final comments? No, and then I would request uh, Dr. Praveen Sanjay, Suryamshi. Sanjay is, can, there. is there on? No. He's there. He's very much there. Praveen, Praveen can Praveen. you pass on yeah. any comments? You're muted, Praveen. Dr. Praveen, you're muted. Yeah. Yeah. So, a wonderful session. I really appreciate everyone's effort making such a wonderful videos. And another just a small comment that the, I have seen at most of the 
uh, even teaching institute, postgraduate are doing vascular, uh, sorry, bowel anosomies with staplers. So my request is that, you know, at the beginning of their career, they must master this art of hand suture anastomosis. And once they have mastered them, they can suture to any technique what they are comfortable. But if you really want to learn suturing technique and tissue respect, start doing your own bowel anastomosis. And again, it is said that the, any compl complication is uh, very disheartening to the surgeon, but the bowel anastomosis leak is like a nightmare to the surgeon. So every surgeon must master this art of bowel uh, anastomosis. And I'm very happy that Punit has done extremely well. And again, another apprehension is the bleeding during the surgery. And if you really master this art of vascular suturing anastomosis, then that apprehension will also go away. And definitely it will help you to become a very confident surgeon. And um, uh, our opponent has, what I would say, if you really want to impress other subspecialty, you must know uh, uretic anastomosis also. So thank you very much. Absolutely. Uh, and congratulations to our uh, president, Dr. Prabhal, for taking this initiative in such a great enthusiasm. Please keep it up. Thank you. Yeah, wonder thank you. Wonderful words, uh, Praveen, and also tips. Encouraging words. Thank you. And I would request Dr. Pratapurte, our Honorary Secretary, to propose the word of thanks. Normal. Uh, thank you very much, sir. President ASI, Dr. Prabhul Niyogi, Vice President, Dr. Praveen Suryanshi, Immediate Past President, Dr. Sanjay Kumar Jain, Treasurer, Dr. Bhavarlal Yadav, Director Academic Council, Dr. G. Siddesh, Advisor to ASI EC, Dr. Santo John Abraham, sir and today's panelists, moderated by Dr. Mohammad Moinuddin, sir, from Gulbarga, and today's esteemed uh, speakers, Dr. Puneet from Varanasi, Dr. Vimal uh, Laipe from Kochi, and Dr. Pavnidharlal from New Delhi. Today, we have discussed the three important uh, anastomoses, which were elaborated thoroughly by the three important uh, eminent speakers. Dr. Puneet wonderfully explained about the tips and the tricks of bowel anastomosis, types of anastomosis and the techniques and principles of it, suturing techniques like Lombard, Cushing's, Halstead and Canal sutures, which every postgraduate should know. Various techniques from end-to-end -end and end-to-side anastomosis were demonstrated by the video demonstration and how to negotiate a caliber of the bowel by chitling it. And he concluded by mentioning that it should be tension-free, ensuring patency, and it, you should not forget the closure of the mesentery defect. Dr. Vimal Laipe explained in detail about the basic principles of vascular anastomosis, end-to-end -end and the patch repairs, instruments required, suture material used, and techniques and principles of vascular anastomosis. Important point is not to take the knots at the corner as we take at the bowel anastomosis, and mis mistakes which can happen during the vascular surgery. Dr. Pavanindra Lal, sir, enlightened us about how to go about the ureteric anastomosis, principles of doing the same in a spatulated manner, and it is always safer to have an interrupted suture in the same. He explained about the indications like trauma and intraoperative uh, uh, indications, incidences, steps of anastomosis with a wonderful video demonstration by both and laparoscopic methods. So I thank all the speakers and the moderator, Dr. Mainandyut, sir, for this wonderful demonstration of these anastomotic techniques. Mm -hmm. And I think this will be a webinar, will be a torch bearer for all the postgraduates throughout the country. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pratap. Uh, and uh, truly meet next Wednesday, same time, eight, ASI time, 8.30 to 9.30. Uh, have a good night and goodbye.